Neuromelanin now. Uh, neuromelanin is found in neurons. Neurons are cells in the nervous system, including the brain. And it's a little bit different from the regular melanin, peripheral melanin, which is melanin in the skin, the eyes, and the, and the hair. Um, one of the main differences being that whereas melanin that's found in the skin and in the eyes and in the hair is created by or in cells called melanocytes, Neuromelanin doesn't appear to be made by melanos melanocytes. Neuromelanin is, is created within neurons. And I'll just quote from this, uh, this uh, article here. It says, neuromelanin is absent at birth and becomes detectable in the brain around age one. It increases in synthesis, i.e. production, during adolescence and continues to do so throughout a person's lifetime. As a result, aged brains have a, darker appear have a darker appearance in those regions in the brain. Neuromelanin is most noticeable in the substantia nigra and locus corelius. And this is an image here of the substantia nigra. Substantia nigra, uh, it means black stuff. That's basically what substantia nigra means. And the reason, the reason it's called the black stuff is because it looks black. You can literally, if you, you know, when, when scientists... Uh, look at brains, you know, obviously dead people's brains, and they, they, they slice the brain open, they see a dark area where the, the substantia nigra is. And the reason why, the reason it's dark is because of the neuromelanin. The melanin in the neurons in that area are what give it the dark appearance, hence the name substantia nigra. Now, what I found, one thing I found quite interesting to, to read was that um, the humans, the level of neuromelanin or the amount that the amount of neuromelanin that humans have in our brains is way, way much, much higher than the amount of melanin that other neuro, neuromelanin that other creatures, other animals have in their brains. So, so an article here again, I'll quote from it says, although neuromelanin is actually present in some other species as varied as monkeys, dolphins and frogs. The highly abundant quantity of neuromelanin in the brainstem seems unique to humans as a dark pig pigmentation of this brain area is not apparently observed in other animal species at the macroscopic level. In fact, in the mammalian brain, which is the brain of mammals, neuromelanin accumulation inc increases progressively as the evolutionary relation to man becomes closer. And uh, I'll stop there. So. So the, the point there is that we as human beings have the highest concentration of neuromelanin out of any other creatures. And the concentration of neuromelanin reduces the lower down the evolutionary chain that you go, if you want to call it that. So the simpler the organisms become, so-called, quote unquote, simpler the organisms become, the less neuromelanin that they have in, you know, in their brains. So you could say that neuromelanin is like, uh, high quantities of neuromelanin in the brain are a spelling mistake there are a marker of humanness. You know, humans have much higher levels of neuromelanin than any other organism, and uh, I just I just found that quite interesting. Now, I'll just quickly say that the neuromelanin is not. Neuromelanin is, is, is something that's only really been kind of studied in any great detail fairly recently. It's only really in the last kind of 10 years or so, I, I think, 10, 15 years, that, which is a short time in, in science. It's only really in that short amount of time that neuromelanin has been, has been discussed in any great detail. It's been, you know, papers have been coming out, studies and so forth. And as a result, it's, there's not much consensus about what neuromelanin does. In fact, a lot of these scientists up till fairly recently, they consider neuromelanin as, as junk. And this is something you see so many times in when you read science that often these scientists, they assume that something has no purpose because they don't know the purpose of it. So they call it junk, just like they used to call D, um, what was it? Before they before epigenetics was kind of found out about or, or talked about, they used to think that uh, anything outside of just DNA, any genetic material outside of DNA was just junk, junk genetic material, because they didn't know what it did. 
and that's what they thought. That's how that's how they approached neuromelanin. They used to talk about neuromelanin as if it had no purpose, but now they know that neuromelanin has lots of purposes, including it's a free radical scavenger. It helps to protect the brain, as we're going to see in a minute, and um, and it's got a very complex relationship with, as I said, with neurodegeneration. So going back to the article here to quote the article or this this study says that well yeah so my article says that neuromelanin has been shown to have a protective effect against neurodegenerative diseases neuro neurodegenerative diseases or we could just call that diseases that call that cause neurons to die are conditions characterized by the damage and destruction of neurons Two of the most well-known and common forms of these diseases are Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And this quote from the National Health Service website in the UK basically explains that Parkinson's disease is caused by a loss of nerve cells in the substantia nigra. We talked about the substantia nigra already. The substantia nigra is where the cells containing neuromelanin exist. So this is, you can start to see where the, the, what the connection is going to be. So there's in Parkinson's disease, there's a reduction in a chemical called dopamine in the brain. Dopamine plays a vital role in regulating the movement of the body. A reduction in dopamine is responsible for many of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Exactly what causes the loss of nerve cells is unclear. Most experts think that a combination of genetic and environmental factors is responsible. Again, that's from a, the National Health Service website. So this is a this is a this is a, a, a an, an image here. So you can see there that you know it's got a white face there, the pointy you nose know, there. That's fair enough. This is Britain. Britain's a white country, so they've got a white white face there. But uh, I'll mention how that's probably suitable to have a white image there, an image of a Euro and person, white person, I'll go on to that. But basically what you see here, that's a normal neuron, the nerve endings there on the neuron and lots and lots of dopamine being, you know, sent over to the receptor. And, uh, you know, the, the, the dopamine goes into the, 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 the receptor, the receiving uh, cell and results in normal movement. Whereas if some, if a cell has been affected by, Parkinson's disease, you see there's much less dopamine there going into the, the receptor uh, cell, resulting in disorders of movement, such as tremors, slow movement, and rigidity. So that's what, that is what, that's what Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease is. A lack of dopamine results in the tremors, the, the you know, the, the slow movement and all that kind of stuff, the stiffness and all that sort of stuff. That's Parkinson's disease, very common in the UK and the US. Um, and, and so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the loss of dopamine, which, uh, which is pinpointed as the cause of these symptoms. Now, this, uh, this is a quote from another article here. It says, a century ago in 1919, Konstantin Tretyakov reported for the first time in his remarkable doctorate thesis, the presence of a marked loss of pigmented neurons in the substantia nigra, visible with the naked eye in the brains of Parkinson's disease patients. And he says, this observation remains to this day the cardinal pathological diagnostic criterion for Parkinson's disease. Uh, so so this, is, this is an image here. I hope you can see. I'll get rid of that. Can't really, sorry, I can't get rid of that. But you see, this is, a, this is, a, this is the substantia nigra there and it zooms in and you can see there see this dark bit here these, these oh, sorry that's the substantia nigra here the dark bit there and in a normal brain quote unquote normal brain it's dark because of the neurons that are in there which are pigmented full of neuromelanin but in a brain that's been affected by parkinson's disease it's not dark because the well my understanding is because the neurons have died basically um, and, the, and the neuromelanin is no longer concentrated there, and thus the dopamine is not concentrated there. Um, the, the neurons which contain neuromelanin are called dopaminergic um, neurons, meaning they, they contain dopamine. And so, so yeah, 
uh, Parkinson's, dis Parkinson's disease is the way the way that they just diagnose Parkinson's is to look into the brain. The best way of doing it is to look into the brain literally and just see: is it dark there in the substantia nigra? If it's not, then that's a surefire sign that the person, the brain, is has been affected by a neuromelanin. Now, I first came across neuromelanin a few years ago, in about 2015, and at that time, I just thought. I'd, I've got a video on my on my channel where I talk about melanin, and in that video, I talked about how I thought that there was a correlation between melanin in the in the epidermis, the skin, the the the, corn, the eyes, the hair, even in the ear. Oh, the skin and the hair, the skin, the hair, and the eyes. I I basically argued that there's a, there's probably a connection between the melanin levels there that you can see, basically, and the melanin levels that you can't see, including in the inner ear and also in the brain. And I, I, I justified that supposition partly by saying that when you look at the statistics, the rates of neurodegeneration are always lower amongst black people than they are amongst other lighter skinned people. So here's an article which uh, which, which lays that out. It says, most studies report the highest prevalence of Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease in white populations. For example, 1,670 per 100,000 compared with 1,036 per 100,000 in blacks and 1,138 per 100,000 in Asians. So that's, I was just like, yeah, that's, that's, that's all, you know, we, we must have higher levels of neuromelanin, which protects our brain. And I'll talk about in a minute how neuromelanin is, is seems to protect the brain against degeneration. And thus, that's why we have, we don't suffer so much from, from these diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's and others. Um, so we'll come back to that in a minute. This is interesting though. Geographical location is a stronger determinant of Parkinson's disease than ethnicity. The prevalence of Parkinson's disease in black Africans residing in sub-Saharan Africa is much lower than the prevalence of Parkinson's amongst people of African origin living in the USA. And look at this. Whereas the, the rate even for Africans, you know, black Africans in America is a thousand per hundred thousand. In Africa, so-called sub-Saharan Africa, it's 40 per hundred thousand. That is you know, orders of magnitude lower than what it is amongst black people in the United States. So clearly that tells us that even, yes, there's going to be some, I'm sure there's going to be some genetic factors behind it. And I, I think it's fairly obvious that there are some gen genetic factors, which explain, for example, the differences between white people and black people in a place like the United States, United Kingdom. There's a genetic reason as to why black people don't get, park, don't get, neurodegenerative diseases to anywhere near the level of lighter skin people. However, there's obviously an environmental factor, a big environmental factor in that as well, because the genetics of black people in the United States or the UK is the same genetics as black people in Africa. You know, um, if anything, actually, I, I just thought about this, if anything, the genetics of black people in America would show more admixture of non-black people, basically non-black. Non, non uh, so i.e. because of the higher level of race mixing, if you want to call it that in the US, you would expect the rate of, um, oh, sorry, what am I saying? Yeah, that, that probably does help to partly explain as well, the fact that there is some admixture, but that wouldn't explain why it's so much lower um, you know, amongst amongst black people in 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 uh, in in Africa. So there's clearly an environmental thing there. And as with so many things, modern life, so-called modern life, which people are so proud of and 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 arrogant about, holding their chest out, saying, "Look how advanced we are. We are so much more advanced than the Africans and Asians and all these, you know, peasants and heathens." But actually, modern life is very very sick and very very diseasing. You know, so many different every I love listening to kind of science podcasts, health podcasts, every condition you can think of. You know, you, you look at the rates of these diseases, whether it be heart disease, uh, cancers, various different cancers, 
you know, lung diseases, all these kinds of things. Whichever one you look at, you always see that the rates are much higher in so-called developed countries than they are in so-called underdeveloped countries. So modern life, we just, I mean, look at it, we're surrounded by by pollution, by light pollution, air pollution. We're not, we're sedentary, we're sat down all the time. We're, we're, we're not breathing fresh air. We're not going out, uh, being excess, you know, exercising. We're not eating proper food, clean food, organic food, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, that's that's going to be a, a huge part of it for, for sure, for sure. But, uh, and then this this chart here basically shows the, the incidence of deaths from, what is it? The incidence of deaths from neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and you can see here that where it's blue, the deaths are much lower. I mean, look at this. I almost swore. Look at this. Blue is like, one percent of uh what does that mean one percent of people who one percent of, of of people die from neurodegenerative diseases in places like africa look there's if i look closely there you go uganda that's quite dark blue central african republic very dark blue anyway all blue here very very low in africa and asia and then you have it goes up and up and up the more so-called advanced that you get. So look, these are all the richer countries, Western Europe, Northern Europe, North America, Australia. You're looking at, you know, 10%, 15%, 20%. Of, I mean, that's astonishingly high, you know. So anyway, that's the point there, that the, the rates of um, the rates of neurodegenerative diseases amongst white people and, and non-black people are much higher than amongst black people. Now, as I said, I initially, I'll just, I'll just come here for a second. I initially um, assumed that the, that that fact was because we just have higher rates of a higher level of uh, of neuromelanin in our brains. However, we're going to discuss now in a minute that the relationship between neuromelanin and neuron, neuron, neuronal death, neurodegeneration, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and so forth is not quite as straightforward to just say the more that you have. The, the more protected you are. It's not quite that straightforward. And I was very surprised. This is something I've only learned in the last few months. I was very, very surprised to, 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 to read this. Now, another thing I'll say as well is that I can't find any, any studies which, which just say, look, how, which measure levels of neuromelanin in the brains of people of different ethnicities. I've not, I've not found a single scientific paper which does that, which I'm surprised at. Um, but you know, I would I would assume that maybe we've got higher levels of neuro of uh, neuromelanin, black people that is. However, I think based on what I'm gonna what we're gonna go through in a minute, I think what's more likely is that either our the neurons that we have which contain the neuromelanin are stronger and more durable, or perhaps the melanin that the, the neuromelanin that's produced in those cells is stronger and more durable than than that than is the case for other uh, people of other ethnicities so let's talk about this so what what's quite interesting i'll do a little what, what exactly happens what's the connection between between um neuro what's the connection between neuromelanin and of and and um neurons dying what's what's that all about well back to the article here here we go. So the protective effects of neuromelanin. Yep, there certainly are some protective effects. So Parkinson's is met, is marked by the loss of neurons which contain both dopamine and neuromelanin. And again, a neuron is simply a cell in the nervous system. Nerve cell, you can call it. Obviously, we have cells in various other parts of the bodies, but the cells in the nervous system are called neurons. And uh neuromelanin and dopamine are contained in the same neurons. What's interesting is that, as we've seen earlier, too, li too little dopamine is associated with neurodegeneration. However, too much dopamine is also, is also associated with, uh, with neurodegeneration. So this is an article here I'll quote from. Dopamine accumulation can induce, can induce neuronal death. However, Excess dopamine can be removed by converting it into a stable compound like neuromelanin, and this process rescues the cell, which is interesting. So, so one of the, one of the things that I really that I, I really get from 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 all of this reading is is uh, the importance of what's called homeostasis. 
which is basically our bodies are just are constantly finding the right level, the right balance of cert, of of elements, of of chemicals, of uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, what's the word? But bacteria, bacteria, all these kinds. Of, we're constantly trying to find the right levels, the right levels of of these things to keep us basically going. Our bodies are are frighteningly complicated things, <laughs> you know. And this is a great example because yeah, here you have. Dopamine, too too little dopamine, you, you're gonna get Parkinson's disease. Too much dopamine, you could get Parkinson's disease. <laughs> but but the body actually, um, the, the the brain can actually uh, convert excess dopamine into neuromelanin, and that results in the cell not dying. Another way, and this is the way that I was I was familiar with this this so uh, this function of neuromelanin. Neuromelanin, like melanin in many other parts of the body, can actually bind to toxic elements, elements that can cause damage. And this, this is called chelation. And so this article here, the ability of neuromelanin to act as a black hole capable of chelating redox active metals and a wide variety of drugs suggests that it could be a high capacity storage trapping system and as such might prevent neuronal damage. And let me just say as well, I've got the links to all of these articles, all of the studies that I've looked at, the links are there. Most of them, you don't have, you know, they're, they're free. If not, you can just use Sci-Hub and unlock them for free. But um, melanin, let me just say, you melanin, which is the melanin that causes the black skin, the dark skin, the black hair, and so on and so forth, has been shown to uh, be a free radical sc scavenger, which means taking taking um, atoms which would otherwise cause problems could ca cause cancer, gathering them up and pre preventing of preventing them from causing harm. Uh, eumelanin also uh, has been shown. I think I think in the ear. I, I've got a study. I'll do a study on this one day. But it's been shown in the ear and other parts of the body to bind to toxic metals. So. Uh, and this is this is the key way that neuromelanin protects neurons by binding to things, especially iron. Iron in the brain is extremely dangerous, and iron, iron in the brain is associated with, with with lots of problems. But melanin, melanin, neuromelanin binds to the iron and basically traps it like a strong man and says, "Nope, you're not going to do any damage to this brain, son." And as a result, um, you know, prevents against neurons dying. Uh, but where are we? However, where are we, where are we? yeah. However, things get even more complicated because too much neuromelanin in the neurons apparently can trigger Parkinson's type type uh, uh, things. So this is a really this was something that's only been found out in the last two or three years uh, as a result of some some animal uh, models that were made. So I'll quote from this article. It says, the potential contribution of neuromelanin to Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease pathogenesis, i.e. the creation of Parkinson's disease, remains unknown because in contrast to humans, common laboratory animals lack neuromelanin. So lab rats, you know, those albino lab rats and so forth, they don't have neuromelanin. As I said before, humans have extremely high quantities of neuromelanin, much higher than any other animals, and um, lab, lab, the commonly used lab animals don't have neuromelanin. However, the, the recent introduction of a rodent model exhibiting an age-dependent production of human-like neuromelanin has allowed, for the first time, for the consequences of progressive neuromelanin accumulation up to levels reached in elderly human brains to be addressed in vivo, which means in live animals. In these animals, intracellular neuromelanin accumulation above a specific threshold compromises neuronal function and triggers a Parkinson's-like pathology. Uh, intracellular... Uh, so, so although neuromelanin is a crucial player in the nervous system and plays important protective functions for neurons, it seems that neurons might get too full of neuromelanin. And then when that happens, Parkinson's disease symptoms can come about, which is, you know, mind boggling. Now, the reason for this might be related to neuromelanin's ability to bind to harmful elements. And I'll, uh, yeah, so in neuro, it, this, this quote from this, this uh, study here points out that in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, 
one thing they find consistently is that there are higher levels of metals in the in the brains and the neurons and in the brains of people affected by these diseases, showing that these metals have toxic effects on on the brains. And so this, let me read this very carefully because this is this is not this is you know quite an interesting point. It says that it's been suggested that the increased metal load might be a byproduct of a loss of neuromelanin's ability to bind to the metals. So normally, let me let me come out of this and, and, and just be there. Yeah. So normally, neuromelanin protects the neurons from damage. However, when it seems that if too much neuromelanin accumulates in the neurons, for some reason, the neuromelanin might cease to be able to bind to those toxic elements. And, and because it can't bind to those toxic elements anymore, it releases the toxic elements, which are then able to go off and destroy neurons, thus causing Parkinson's and, and, and Alzheimer's. It could also be that um, too much too much neuromelanin actually causes the neurons themselves to die. And when the neuron dies, it's suggested that the, the, neuro, the, the neuromelanin is then kind of left to just go off and float around in the brain and the metals that used to be bound to the neuromelanin preventing them from causing damage are then free to go off and cause uh, neuronal damage it's, it's complicated um but complicated but i get it it makes sense to me it makes sense to me how you know how this could be the case with, so, conclusion from this article, uh, with all of this in mind, whereas before I just assumed that black people must have more neuromelanin, which explains the lower rates of neurodegenerative diseases, my thoughts have now shifted. I'm more inclined to think that the neuromelanin in black brains, or black people's brains, I should say, is just more durable and effective, meaning that it is less prone to being saturated by toxic elements and less prone to releasing them into the brain. And and, my, and again, I've got my uh, I've got all of my sources here. Every single thing I've said in this article is not my own. You know, I've got it from various res research articles. Most of them, as well, posted over the last five years. This is how new this kind of area of research is. When you when you look at when you if you go on Google or wherever you know your you know friendly search engine and you search neuromelanin, most of the conversations about neuromelanin take place in the context of conversations about Parkinson's disease. There's an increasing amount of interest in neuromelanin because what basically because it's thought by these people that if they can if they can find a way of um you know um using neuromelanin therapeutically they might be able to prevent people from getting Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative uh, uh, conditions. Now, this is made much harder because neuromelanin, like all melanin, is extremely, extremely tough. You, it's, it's virtually insoluble. You can't just put it in some acid like you would do for other kinds of, uh, you know, chemicals or chemical substances. Neuromelanin is extremely extremely hard to break down and so the, basically scientists don't really know that much about it what it's made of and you know it's it's complex complex kind of structure so that's the, that's the issue you've heard the term black don't crack well when it comes to melanin that absolutely is the case black don't crack you can't crack melanin very easily and so that frustrates western scientists and scientists around the world uh, no end because it means that they can't you know, get the secrets of melanin to work out what's going on there. But that's 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 the end of that discussion anyway about neuromelanin and Parkinson's disease. I'll post a link to the uh, to the article in the comments after this. Uh, or oh, I'll I'll do a community community posts after this uh, this video is finished. Now the other the other thing I want to talk about in this video, another sciencey uh, topic, relates to malaria. Now, malaria, as as you obviously know, malaria is a very, very um, it's a, it's a disease which causes a whole load of problems for people, particularly black people, uh, Af people in Africa and other parts of uh, other parts of the sort of global south. Um, sickle cell is one of those things that I grew up. You know, I kind of knew about sickle cell. I knew some people who who had sickle cell and they would get sick often. And I didn't. That's, I didn't really know anything about it, much about it. But what I want to do in this video is to share some of the learnings I've I've had over the last few years with regard to um, sickle cell, and to point out basically the, the TLDR of this 
section is that sickle cell exists because it provides protection against malaria. Yeah, that's the that's the basic overview. But let's let's get into the, the, the weeds about this. So here we go. Sickle cell and malaria. Again, another article on my blog, Africans Arise. Uh, and this map here gives you a little clue as to what's going on here. This is a this is a map of the prevalence of sickle cell in Africa. You see there, the darker, the, the higher the prevalence. And this is a map of the prevalence of malaria in Africa. And you see there, it's basically, it's basically the same, isn't it? So that tells us what's going on here. But let's, let's first of all, let's talk about sickle cell anemia. What is sickle cell anemia? Sickle cell anemia is a disorder caused by a variant of a gene that affects hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the oxygen carrying molecule within our red blood cells. If a person inherits one of these mutated genes, so you, you know that we've got like 20,000 genes or, or between 20 and 25,000 genes in our DNA. And uh, we, we, we get them one set from our father, one set from our mother. So we inherit two genes, one from the mum, one from the, from the dad, two genes for the, you know, for the same thing. So this gene relating to hemoglobin, we get one gene from the dad, one gene from the mum. If the mum, Oh, sorry, it doesn't matter which sex the parent is, but if one of the parents has the uh, unusual gene, which is here, and and a, and a usual gene, they are called carriers of sickle cell. In other words, they carry the sickle cell trait. And here we have here as well. If you had a if you had two parents who both carry the sickle cell traits, this image shows you the chances of their children going on to get full-blown sickle cell anemia. There's a one in four chance that uh, the child, let's say they had four children. One of the, there's a there's a 25% chance that uh, one of them is going to get full-blown sickle cell anemia, which means that they're going to inherit the uh, mutated gene from both the father and the mother. Uh, there's a there's a 50% chance that um, the children will have uh, the traits will also be trait carriers. So in in this case, you know they will carry they will inherit one mutated gene and one regular gene. And there's a 25% chance, one in four chance that the that the baby won't have any won't pick up any uh, trait at all. Uh, meaning that they won't even yeah they won't be, even be a carrier of sickle cell. They won't be they won't be a trait carrier. Now, just one thing I wanted to say is that if us as black people in particular, it's really important that we are aware of our status. You know, so you, it's very easy to do, a, to do a, a test for the sickle cell trait. Very, very simple here in the UK, at least. I'm sure it's the case in many other countries. I would basically recommend to you, if you haven't already done it, if particularly if you're still single or haven't really had children, go and get yourself tested for the sickle cell trait. Because if you have the trait, and then your your partner also has the trait, then you're looking at these chances of, of, of you know, you're looking at one in four chance that your child is going to have sickle cell anemia. And that's no, that's no light thing to have sickle cell anemia. Because what does it do? Well, sickle cell anemia basically causes the blood. This is a really good, a really good image here. Sickle cell anemia causes the blood, red blood cells to form odd shapes. So this is, these are normal red blood cells flowing through the blood vessels. And you see the shape there, they can just flow through all very, all very fine, all simple. Um, and it's all, you know, it's, it's soft and whatnot, and it can move free, freely to the, which means that the red blood cells can take oxygen to the various different parts of the body. Boom, everything's fine. But for, in people who are, who have sickle cell anemia, there's a problem the blood cells are likely to get sticky and form these very uh, sickled type uh, structures, which is why it's called sickle cell anemia. And when that happens, it means that the blood cells, the red blood cells can't actually go through the blood vessels properly, which means that organs of our body are not going to get, uh, are not going to get oxygen. They're not going to get the red, uh, a proper blood supply. And then, as we read here, this results in a vast array of problems, including hemolytic anemia, which is basically red blood cells die out, which means low blood 
anemia is low blood. And so because there's low blood in different organs, those organs can become under tremendous pressure because our organs need blood. Without blood, we're nothing. So the organs can you know, be damaged and, uh, and, and even fail. And it says here that acute chest syndrome is a typical example of organ failure and sickle cell disease and one of the leading causes of hospitalization and death amongst patients. Really, really sad. Now, some some really horrible horrible statistics here. Sickle cell anemia is a is something that really does you know wreak havoc in my mother in our motherland of Africa. Some quotes here: seventy percent of babies born with sickle cell anemia are born in Africa, especially in Nigeria and Kong and the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Although infant mortality amongst children with sickle cell anemia is falling in, in richer countries, it's extremely high in Africa still. Now, I've not been able to find any newer statistics than this, but it was estimated in 2010. Look at this. It was estimated that between half and all of um, children who have sickle cell anemia die before their fifth birthday. I mean, that's that's... That's shocking, shocking, really sad, really just makes me tremble with with um, anger, fear, you know, sadness about that, because that's horrendous. Now, in, in places like the UK and the US and so forth, they, you know, that's why when you have a baby, like I should have brought the, my hospital books for, for my sons, but that's something that they do. They'll, they'll test your children for sickle cell trait, particularly if you're black, particularly if you're so-called sub-Saharan African in your um, in your ancestry, they'll they'll do a test as just as a matter of norm, but they don't do that in many in most African countries. You know that's a symptom of our underdevelopment, unfortunately. So that's sickle cell. What about malaria? What sickle cell got to do with malaria? Well, uh, as I said before, sickle cell uh, you know came has survived and 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 prospered, if you like because it does confer a protective effect against malaria. So the so-called malaria hypothesis was first postulated by Western scientists in the early 20th century. The hypothesis begins by noting that malaria has been around for thousands of years and until recently has resulted in almost certain death in infancy and, even, and still does result in almost certain death in infancy in, in Africa. So. Uh, you know, malaria is, is clearly would have played a role in natural selection. So that the idea was that because malaria affects blood cells, they thought, well, anything, any other condition or whatever that, that changes the structure of blood cells or composition of blood cells could also help to hinder the spread of malaria. So it was so, it was hypothesized that um, anything that could change the shape of blood cells uh, any condition that would change the shape of blood cells would be higher, would be common in areas with high malaria prevalence. And that is exactly what you see here. This is a map of the prevalence of malaria here on the left-hand side and the prevalence of the the, uh, the gene that causes uh, sickle cell on the left, on the right-hand side. And it's almost a perfect match, isn't it? You've even got like little islands here in certain areas where they don't have it. Most of, um, you know, Ghana, Nigeria, Congo, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Kenya, some, even Somalia, parts of Ethiopia, even going up to Egypt, you know, malaria is very is very prevalent. And in most of those areas, the gene, the, the, the mutation that causes sickle cell is, is also prevalent. Now, what they found is that uh, a researcher in the 1950s working in Kenya demonstrated that sickle cell anemia prevalence correlates closely with malaria prevalence. He also showed that people with sickle cell trait seems to contract malaria less frequently. Subsequent research has found that people who carry the trait, so that's people like these two or these two, when you carry the sickle cell trait, you can still get malaria, but you're much, much, much less likely to get the more severe forms of malaria. And there's one article here, they're 90% less likely to get um, severe sickle cell anemia. And if they do, they very rarely die from it, even from the more severe kinds. So it, so you'll still get sick, you will still get malaria if you have sickle cell trait, but you're much, much, much less likely to be um, 
you know, to die from it. And apparently um, the body is more able to basically flush it out. So what you're seeing here is like a, a fascinating battle basically between the malaria parasite. Malaria comes from a, a, a parasite, a single cell parasite and humans, whereby the parasite has come and wreaked havoc with us. And then, uh, you know, there's been this genetic variant amongst us. You can kind of look at it as like X-Men, you know, let me, let me, let me come out of this. Um, there's the, there's a, you know, the body, humans have developed the ability to, to um, protect against the negative effects of malaria through this sickle cell trait. But where, where it's kind of, you know, it's a high stakes game because obviously something, the body nature, mother nature is amazing and it's come up with something to defend against this malaria, which will basically wipe out a population if it spreads very widely. However, while the trait is beneficial, if you have, if you have sick, full blown sickle cell anemia, unfortunately your, you know, your chances of growing into adulthood are very low. And 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 uh, so that's that's the deal there. Sickle cell. The reason why we have such high levels of sickle cell amongst black people in Africa and other parts of the world is because sickle cell gives sickle the sickle cell trait confers protection against malaria. But um, but at the same time, if you have two people who have sickle cell trait and they have children, then it's likely they're going to be given birth to children who have full blown sickle cell anemia, which is going to result in them uh, facing problems. As were as bad as uh, as malaria would have would have caused, including death at a fairly young age. So fascinating stuff. From, <laughs> I hope you agree. Um, this these two things that we've discussed today: new, neuromelanin and its relationship with neurodegeneration, such as Parkinson's, and sickle cell and its relationship to malaria, show just how complex the human body is. And what I've tried to do in this video is to focus on things which are of particular interest to black people, to African people, members of the African diaspora, so that we can, you know, for one thing, as I said, with regard to sickle cell, I think it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we're doing the testing, make sure that we're getting the, tr we're being screened for the trait. And if you have the trait, it sounds harsh, but you've got to think really seriously about whether you really want to crack on and, and have children with, with with someone else who has the trait, knowing that there's a much higher chance that your children are going to develop sickle cell anemia. Um, and yeah, that's that's it really. That's 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 my um that's my that's my uh, thoughts on 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 those two subjects. Hope this has been of of interest to to you guys. And uh, yeah, let me know your thoughts. If anyone's got any thoughts or insights or, or additional information that you can you can add, actually, because you know I'm not technically I'm not a scientist, but you know I love science. I love reading about these scientific issues. But yeah, if you've got any, if anyone's got any ideas, any thoughts, any corrections, any clarifications, anything like that, any any other topics that you think would be interesting to discuss, then then by all means do share. To share in the in the comments box. For now, this has been me, Eli Wananda, aka Mindful Black Dad, aka Africans Arise. Take care for now, and I will speak to you soon.